Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Trav from Web3 Matters, and we've got with us Brian from Santiment. And uh, our goal today is to highlight some of the top indicators on the Santiment platform. And uh, before we dig in, Brian, I'd love for you to just give us a quick in introduction into what Santiment is and how it could help our audience here in the crypto world. Absolutely. Thanks, Trav. Great to be here with you. We are uh, a platform that's been around since 2017. Our goal is to provide the top on-chain social and development activity metrics at the fingertips of our user base, giving them an advantage, obviously, in seeing what's going on in the markets, whether they want to use that for analytical purposes or trading purposes is entirely up to them. And we have uh, various membership tiers, depending on how uh, deep they would like to get into the blockchain material. So it's a, a really great source for understanding what's going on kind of behind the crypto curtains at any given time. And we've got a dedicated staff and community that's ready to help out and make sure that new members are able to understand what they're getting into. Thank you for that, Brian. And uh, just to add my own personal use cases to the video here, um, I personally use Santiment to um, inform my trades, uh, which has been an absolute game changer. And I also use it to uh, just perform analysis that I like, I like to share with the community as well. That gives a non-biased opinion on what's actually happening behind the scenes. And I think that's what makes crypto uh, in general and the blockchain so unique is that unlike the stock market, all of the data that's happening behind the scenes is there for us to check out. And that's what I appreciate so much about Santiment is it is it makes it understandable and accessible to everyone here. So um, Brian, let's let's dive into it. What do you have for us for some indicators here? What uh, let's do a quick um, overview on what we're going to be looking into today. Yeah, so I'm going to show kind of what a typical user would use when they log on to Santiment and they're trying to get an overlay of what's happening in the markets. Uh, let me know that my screen is sharing OK on your end. Yep, it's crystal <laughs> clear, my friend. Excellent. So this is what's known as our data screener. And this is kind of step one, in my opinion, in terms of just getting the lay of the land, understanding what the latest changes are uh, from a day to day perspective. You'll notice these green buttons here that say 1D. You can switch them to seven or even 30 days. I'll just switch them to seven uh, so we can get a nice short to midterm uh, idea of how markets have fluctuated over the past week. And we can see just right off the bat on this top tree map, uh, we're seeing less discussion over time about Bitcoin. This essentially means there's about 10% less discussion uh, related to the overall market conversations, including all assets compared to the week before. So essentially Bitcoin is being talked about less and less over time as it's gotten boring. You can see down here, which is showing the price percentage changes. Bitcoin's down 0.8% over the past week. So there's a certain level of what I believe is complacency and apathy right now to the general markets as traders are looking more toward, you know, what's going on with staked Ethereum or wrapped Tron or Immutable X, which are especially Immutable X here I see is having double the amount of talks over the past week compared to the week before. So Essentially, this is just a way to look at the social volume and price changes over time for around the top 100 market cap assets. And you can, of course, see the market cap changes and volume changes, especially volume here. Look at that 28% down over the past week compared to the week prior. That's a big drop. So that could be something that you can use for your future predictions, trading strategies, if you so choose. Okay, two quick follow-up questions on that. The first one being for the volume on the bottom right. Is that a social metric or is that uh, actual volume on chain? And then my yeah. second one is, I'm just wondering if you can give us a quick overview on how we can actually interpret this data. Yeah, so to answer question number one, this is trading volume. So this is just overall volume in the markets when combining the 2,800 plus assets that we have on our database so there's i'm sure a few hundred or a few thousand that are being omitted here but they're generally small and not going to impact this number by a great deal so generally it looks like right now the volume according to most of crypto is around 265 billion dollars uh which compared to the week prior was 
is actually a, quite a step down. So that would indicate more complacency. And, and it makes sense based on the fact that prices, especially for Bitcoin, have kind of started to get into this tight range of about 41 to 43 and a half K over the past couple of weeks, give or take a few outlier hours or days. But overall, my interpretation, just looking at this, at, is there's definitely been uh, mostly retracing going on. You can see there, Tron here, this makes up a couple of the big bars. So that's a little misleading. There's a few other outliers like Optimism and of course Chainlink here being the, the most notable riser over the past week. But generally this has been kind of a continuation of what we talked about last month, which is disappointing results since the ETFs were approved by the SEC back on January 10th, just about four weeks ago now. And I think based on some of the other metrics that we'll talk about here in a moment, the sentiment is quite down in crypto. And believe it or not, that's actually a good thing. So when you see a lot of negativity uh, with a metric known as weighted sentiment, which I'll jump to momentarily, that's generally a sign that markets are getting close to having something positive happening. If markets are falling off a cliff, all the negative sentiment usually leads to at least a bit of a, a safe haven day or two or three, or even more probably, it's going to see some sort of bounce. Generally, the way sentiment views prices is markets move the opposite direction of the crowd's expectation at any given time. And I think I told you that last time as well. And that's there's a whole psychological thing behind that where, you know, whales and sharks tend to accumulate when they're seeing all of these mini cells from smaller addresses. They're kind of salivating and waiting for those opportunities so that they can swoop up after everyone else is giving up on the markets. And alternatively, you know, if we go back to late 2021, when every single meme coin and NFT out there were being what we now know were pretty overvalued, that's when they can line up some pretty big sells knowing they could easily jump back in at a later time, which they did about close to a year later in 2022. So that's just a little recap and, and how I generally try to look at uh, social volume fluctuations and price changes. Awesome, Brian. Yes, thank you so much for that. That's um, incredibly grounded and realistic insight into how things are actually happening and going down out here. So, and I think that's a great start to our conversation today. So let's keep this conversation going. So what's the first metric you want to show to us right now? Yeah, so I shared in our chat, you're welcome to share this with your audience. Uh, maybe we'll just put it in the link once you guys are watching this video, but this is kind of my starting point on Sandbase. Uh, if you just go to chart here on app.sandsman.net, you'll see uh, generally a blank Bitcoin price chart and then you can apply different templates like I have here for all sorts of different analysis and insights that I've done, you'll see that they're all public. So you can easily search for anything. If you come up with an asset that you'd like to research, type it in the search and chances are you're going to find something related to that asset or related to a metric that you'd like to look up. So for me, I like to start here. This is my main template. And the first thing I check is how's the trading volume? And if I look at it right now, it's pretty mediocre. Uh, we just saw on the data screener that it's down, what was it, 20, 27, 28% over the past week. And Bitcoin is, of course, going to be the biggest contributor to that fall. So I'm not surprised to see the trading volume is down. Notice how trading volume really peaked right here on January 9th. This was, I mean, we're looking zoomed out, but this was essentially the day of or right before the announcement was made by the SEC. And already right after the announcement was made, you can see the trading volume was starting to fall down. Very typical sign of a top or at least uh, a sign that a pump is going to slow down. You can see that that happened back here, back on October 23rd, after we saw a big pump from 25 to above uh, about 35K. Um, even right here, you can see it drop down right after. So generally a huge tra transaction volume or a trading volume pump is a sign of a upcoming reversal or a sign that the trend is about to stop in its tracks for a little while. Um, if it's a more gradual trading volume climb, like something organic, that's actually a signal that the trend is getting enough support. So it's kind of, it's tricky, but the way I tell people to, to view trading volume is slow climbs are good. One sudden big climb uh, means watch out or at least it's a reversal. So if prices are plummeting and you see a big tra trading volume spike, 
that's actually usually a sign of capitulation and a signal that things are likely about to turn around. So right now, it's kind of just a gradual fade, which is not the best sign uh, because it's kind of supporting the trend of very mild decline like we've seen the past few days. Fantastic. Any any mention or use of volume really activates my brain here and, and gets me excited. Um, the one thing, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm curious on your interpretation of this as well, is that the one thing about volume that I, I personally value is that people can't hide behind volume. And when it comes to big players um, dropping hundreds of millions of dollars in uh, in any sort of position, you know, that's going to show up in this metric. And often, um, you know, when you see massive volume on tops or bottoms, typically from my understanding, that's these massive institutional traders actually buying the bottom or dumping at the top. Does that sort of correlate with what we're seeing here? Yeah, I, I think that's a fair synopsis. Uh, transaction volume can be a little tricky. It's almost like a hybrid signal between trading volume and like whale transactions, because you're absolutely right. Only the big players are the ones that are really capable of generating these huge spikes. You'll often see that it coincide pretty closely with what trading volume is doing. Just like we saw like here, for example, you can see the trading volume spike in white right there. And then transaction volume is basically right next to it. I like to look at it as, as just an overall indication of health and utility. And looking at the USD uh, converter for it can often be a little more useful because Bitcoin being traded in 2024 isn't the same as 2016. The amount of coins might be similar, but the amount of dollars being transacted could be massively different over time. So uh, I, I mostly just look at it as a supplement to trading volume uh, with maybe a little more of a research value as opposed to alpha value for predicting where prices move next. Excellent. No, I really appreciate uh, this metric here. So yeah, what are you thinking of uh, moving on for our next metric? Yeah. So somewhat similarly to what we just talked about with transaction volume, these are more direct indications of how active a network is at any given time and what the utility is on the network. Generally, Prices need to see increasing utility over time in order to justify higher prices. It's more of a long-term trend than anything. If I go to all time, right, we're going all the way back to when our data started in January of 2009, right after the debut of Bitcoin in 2008. Look at how daily active addresses, especially up until 2017, were just exploding. And then right when they were peaking, we see this big collapse. And then we see the same pattern once again as we see this, you know, 2021 pump in April. Uh, this was, you know, that after the first year of COVID basically is when we saw this huge rise. Everyone's stuck at home. Tons of people are discovering crypto for the first time, just like they were seeing back in 2017 when everyone had the memes about grandma around the Thanksgiving table talking about crypto for the first time. This was like everyone's stuck at home. Might as well get into NFTs and crypto. And then we see this local top and then a collapse. One more attempted rise, but look at just how much lower the daily active addresses were compared to the first all-time high that happened in April. So even though we had a slight higher high and the true all-time high that eventually occurred in November, the utility just wasn't there. And that was a good indication that we just weren't getting quite enough steam on the network to justify, you know, Bitcoin going straight to 100K and beyond. Uh, it probably will at some point, not investment advice, but at least in late 2021, it looked like that was not in the cards. So we saw an eventual collapse, but look at how daily active addresses are still significantly higher than, you know, what we saw in 2019 and 20, especially, and going back into the history archives here. It's just not even close. So that's a great thing. It's showing that Bitcoin is seeing much more activity than it used to. And then circulation is essentially the cousin of daily active addresses, where instead of looking at the amount of unique users, you're looking at the amount of unique coins being moved. So this is basically coming through all the wash trading that could be happening with algos and things like that, and actually just looking at how many individual coins are moving at least once per day to get an actu accurate reflection of how many coins are actually moving and, and the overall activity of the network 
which implies just how busy the network is and how much it can move due to all of the action going on. It's incredible to see how few coins have been moving per se now compared to years ago before Bitcoin really was known by anyone. Is Do you have any kind of explanation as to how that highest peak uh, way on the left could have been so high compared to now when we have the daily active addresses you know, as, as consistently high as they are? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I've wondered that myself. You know, I know that Mt. Gox and the hack that happened way back in, in 2011 likely had something to do with this. Uh, obviously, with Bitcoin's price being significantly lower, our price data only goes back to 2013. But um, I, I know it was like under $100 and maybe even under $10 back then. Don't correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, for those watching, but it was obviously so much cheaper back then than it is now that the amount of coins that could be moved affordably for people was infinitely easier than it is now, right? You can't you can't just see a, a random non-millionaire moving around 10 Bitcoin now uh, like it's nothing. And I, I think this the, the higher circulation is more of a reflection of just the the small value of coins that we saw back then and, and how much easier and willy nilly people were moving hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of coins. Like it was nothing, you know, thinking about the uh, pizza that was sold for uh, thousands of Bitcoin, for example. Oh my goodness. Yes. That the tragic story of the, of the pizza that was sold. <laughs> Perfect. My friend. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much for, uh, for that clarification. And that makes a ton of sense here. So moving on, what do you have for us next? Sure. Sure. So the one of our most popular metrics and one that I, I think is probably the most valuable when it comes to identifying future price movement would be MVRV. This stands for market value to realized value. And what it's essentially doing is measuring the average trading returns for specific time intervals for any any coin or any address, I should say, that's been active during that time. So for example, this orange line is measuring the average trading returns for any address that has been active over the past 30 days. When it gets really high, that's a signal that those short-term traders are making a lot more money than they typically do. And it's easy to forget, crypto is a zero-sum game, just like anything else. There isn't magical money that's just being made out of nothing. It's more market cap coming in and losers are giving it up to winners. People who are selling low are giving money to the people who are patient or hodling or had bought in the bottom and are selling at the top, right? So generally, when you're seeing the average returns, like right here, for example, at plus 21%, like we saw about, what, three and a half months ago, that's a sign that there's too much profit going on. And there's likely going to be a bit of a slowdown. If we see the opposite, like we saw back here in August, or even better yet, I'll go back one more year. In fact, I'll just make this like an hour. We don't need to be that granular for the interval. So for example, if we go to uh, November of 2022, most of you recall a giant exchange known as FTX collapsing and the markets crashed significantly. And we were way down in the 16 Ks for Bitcoin, which I know many of you wish you could go back in time and scoop up a whole lot of crypto back then. But you can see the average trading returns were at negative 16% for 30-day and negative 45% for the 365-day active traders. All this means is that whether you're short-term or long-term, the average wallet was likely way underwater, meaning the, the network was undervalued on both a short and long-term perspective. And you could have scooped up a lot with very low risk compared to the usual circumstance for crypto. It's, this is essentially a probability indicator. And the lower you get, especially if both are low at the same time, the less risk you have in adding onto your position or opening a new position versus really high like this, that's uh, increased risk compared to the usual moment in time. So essentially you want to buy when MVRV is super low and below the zero axis and sell when it's significantly above the zero axis. Right now, the short term is about break even, so it can go either way, 
but the long term is still showing, you know, 365 day addresses are about plus 25 percent on their money right now for a metric that normally is expected to fluctuate around zero. So there still appears to be some risk when it comes to long term trading, if that's your strategy. Perfect. I appreciate how there is a different metric for shorter term trades and then also the long term trades. And my first question for you is during a bull cycle, when we do see kind of a consistent uptrend, how low do you expect the 365 day ratio to go before seeing a reversal? Will is it realistic for it to actually get below the zero axis? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to go back five years really quick. And we can see that the lowest points were around June 2022. We got all the way down to about negative 46%. And for the most part, you'll see the MVRV spending an equal amount of time above or below the zero axis. The last time we actually were below was almost a year ago. We're looking at 11 months of being of the 365 day MVRV being above 0%. So that means that crypto has obviously been a, on a heck of a run here. And I can just hold down shift and go like that and see that the price of Bitcoin is, yeah, plus 107%, give or take, since it crossed into the positives here. So at some point, I would be surprised if it doesn't happen in 2024, we'll see the 365 day MVRV go below zero again. And that would be a great sign that we're starting to get into undervalued territory. But I, I wouldn't, if you're seeing it go below zero, I wouldn't just be like, oh, I'm going to wait for it to get all the way below negative 40%. That's, that's often a bit too precise and greedy if you're hoping it's going to get to, you know, it's five year lowest point that won't happen very often. So I always recommend you know, dip in little by little, do some dollar cost averaging when you're starting to see opportune times line up with metrics like the MVRV here. And that makes a ton of sense too, because when we see uh, the most recent lowest lows, that was bear market territory. And um, one thing that seems pretty convincing is that, you know, we've been able to break out of that, uh, that, that price range. So to expect it to go as low as it did back then likely is not super realistic. So that um, that definitely clarifies. And I, I, I'll i just also add here that uh, I think the MVRV is the one, the one indicator that I was looking forward to the most, definitely from seeing uh, some of your previous videos. The power truly is uh, pretty phenomenal here. And it, once again, I appreciate how there's something here for a wide breadth of different trading styles as well. So yes, thank you for pro providing so much clarity on that. So what do you have thoughts on for, for your next indicator here, Brian? Yeah, totally. And I'll just say this about MVRV. I, I didn't prepare it, our model that we have for this video, but we'll show it on another one we do, Trav. It's uh, We have these things known as Sandsheets models that show comparatively around the hundreds of top assets out there, which are showing the best signals for MVRV and which are showing the worst. So you can actually see like a hundred or so different assets lined up next to each other, showing which ones are the most overvalued and undervalued at any given time. So if you like the value of just looking at one MVRV chart here, we've also got separate models that we've made that just straight up compare some of the top assets to one another to find where the best opportunities uh, for buying and the best opportunities for shorting, if that's what your preference is. That's fantastic. And knowing that that's um, a, com a composite of some of the most reputable several thousands of coins that you guys do provide data for, that uh, that makes me extra bullish and extra excited to see that chart here. So um, yeah, excellent. Man. Yes, I look forward to that one, my friend. I see you've got a new chart up here. What are we looking at? So this is the funding rate for a few different exchanges that Santiment has data on. This is, of course, publicly available. You can look up, you know, the Binance funding rate for hundreds of different assets if you want, and you'll see a nice list of, uh, you know, where they are. And essentially, this is measuring the amount, uh, the ratio, I should say, between the people longing through margin trades or leveraged trades and the people shorting. And the theory is, it's not a theory, this is definitely proven, the higher the funding rate is, uh, meaning the, the larger the ratio is between longs versus shorts, the more likely we are to attack because it's indicative of people putting their money on the end of buying versus selling and they're being greedy. 
Whereas if there's a ton of shorts, if you're seeing a lot of red, that actually means there's more shorts than longs and the shorts are paying the longs in order to really try to ride prices down. And you'll notice traders are usually late, right? They'll start shorting in you know mid-March of 2020 after prices have already started to correct in February. And then of course, prices bounced. This was Black Thursday. And of course we saw one of the greatest bull runs of all time over the next year or so. And then on the other, other end of the spectrum, you'll see a lot of people longing like crazy, uh, thinking that crypto is gonna go up forever unknowingly realizing that they're buying in right at the top or close to it. So this is essentially a counter indicator where when you see the crowd shorting like crazy, it's a great time to buy. When you see the crowd buying like crazy, it's a great time to take some profit. Uh, it's not a perfect science. And the more extreme you get, the, the more probable the outcome you're, you're hoping for will come true. But in general, what you want to look for here is a signal that there's an extreme trend one way or the other. And uh, you can profit pretty significantly if you pay attention to uh, some of the anomalies when they pop up. What I'm smiling about over here is it's amazing to see such an accurate uh, representation of people just being so late to the run. Like this actually shows the massive short that we had with the, the, the lowest dip of the funding rates. That was immediately preceded by one of the most impressive bull runs and it, it happened way too late. <laughs> so this is actually something that uh, I've been trying to push here in my own personal content for, for many years. Don't follow the masses. And I just can't wait to, to share this one with the world here to show that people are actually doing this and people are actually getting screwed. So my, my follow-up question for you, is this more of a, a long-term indicator or do you have another version of this or is there another time frame that we could use where we might be able to use this on a shorter trading thesis? Yeah, there's certainly merit in funding rate to using it on a short-term basis. Uh, I would say that you really want to pay attention to extreme situations. So like December 6th, for example, people started to short just after seeing this short-term dip here for about 24 hours. And then obviously prices did shoot back up. Uh, you did still see a little bit of shorting, but like when you see these massive bars, like the largest ratio of shorts over the past three months, you would have profited pretty well if you bought into everyone else, assuming prices were about to collapse. Uh, same here, even on a short term basis, January 5th and 6th, you see a little bit of shorting and prices obviously did uh, skyrocket pretty significantly the next couple of days. Uh, alternatively, on January 1st and 2nd, all of this, you know, New Year's euphoria going on and then prices collapsed right after. So yeah, on a on a day to day swing trader perspective, there's certainly merit for funding rates. This is definitely one that I will be implementing ASAP here. I'm, uh, I'm seeing a lot of the colors on the next chart here, and I can't wait to learn all about it. So, what do you have for us? Yeah, so we'll we'll really s speed right by this one. This is just the whale transaction count for Bitcoin, where we're looking at the amount of transactions converted into one hundred thousand dollars or more, based on where the price is at any given time or $1 million or more here in yellow. And by the way, you can change these if the bars are a bit too noisy for you, which they kind of are for me right now, I can switch to like area charts and that becomes much easier to see and you can kind of see them ebb and flow comparatively to one another over time. And of course you can change the axis too. You can say, let's say I just put the peak at 4,000 and the minimum at 1,000 and you'll see it shift accordingly. But yeah, this is this is essentially just a great way to look at the amount of massive transactions at any given time. And as you'd imagine, when you see big spikes, just like trading volume and circulation, that's when uh, prices tend to do 180. Got you. Okay, perfect. So if I'm understanding this correctly, much like the other indicators we've been looking at, you're looking for the extreme moves. And what you're saying is once you see those extreme highs and lows, that's when you want to expect no financial advice here, a, a shift in, in price direction. Yeah, it's fair to say that the probability of a, of a big shift is basically a signal that, that the trend is about to break and move the opposite direction. Excellent, Brian. No, this, uh, this one really helps. And I look forward to trying this one out for myself as well here. I see a rainbow. Tell me all yeah. about it. This little rainbow of, of lines here is representative of different tiers 
depending on the size of wallets over time. This is looking at the number of wallets based on any size from 0 to 0.001 BTC all the way up to, if you wanted, 1 billion or more, which, of course, there's no address that holds 1 billion Bitcoin, uh, but there are, I believe, this, yeah, 100K or more is the largest, and there are four of those wallets out there. Nakamoto, you know, props to him. Maybe he owns all four of them. But regardless, this is a great way to look at just how many wallets of different sizes there are at any given time. You can see, for example, on January 13th, we suddenly saw, or 14th, I should say, we suddenly saw a slight uptick in whale wallets or the, the largest whale wallets out there, I should say, going from 101 to what's currently 107. So uh, if you're interested in seeing you know, where the largest wallets are going and if there's more of them over time, this is indicating that there is after it actually dropped from November through mid-December. Generally, we like to, for Bitcoin in particular, we like to look at sharks starting at about 10 to 100 BTC, and then whales hold anywhere from 100 all the way to about 10,000 BTC. And you can see, especially the 1K to 10K tier has really increased a lot over just the past couple of weeks here, uh, which might be indicative of, of some accumulation among some of the largest key stakeholders that are active on the network. Yeah, I noticed that you don't have the Bitcoin price action on this chart as well. Is that by design? Yeah, it can simply be added. Um, it's If you want to do a direct correlation with price, you can simply click on price over here on the sidebar, or you can add any metric you want to the chart and just click on the appropriate chart and it'll, it'll be included. So I can add price right here. I can change it to bars or something, make it a bit darker. And then I can actually see how prices have correlated uh, over time. And it appears that the blue line probably has the most correlation here. The 1K to 10K number of wallets might have some very mild correlation to price, but generally I like to merge all three of these. So I can just click the merge button and go to 10 to 100, 100 to 1K, and 1K to 10K, hit confirm. I'm gonna control click that. And this is actually the amount of essentially sharks and whales over time for the past three months. I'll add price back on one more time. So you can just get a quick glimpse of how prices have changed based on the number of sharks and whales over the past three months like so. Very fascinating. So it definitely seems like there appears to be a bit of a decline <clears throat> in total addresses. Uh, so I'm definitely going to be curious to see how that changes in the near future, knowing that the higher tier whales that you had uh, put onto the graph not long ago are definitely seeming to increase here as well. Yeah, ex exactly. I, I see it the same way. And the big shift happened actually right as the bull cycle was starting, interestingly. So this could simply mean that a lot of those shark and whale wallets were liquidated into much smaller wallets and split. Uh, maybe they were moved offline or something like that. But for whatever reason, Prices were able to really take off despite this trend in sharks and whales dropping in number. Very interesting. Excellent and you brain. can also, of course, look at the percentage of supply held, which does look a little bit better, but it's still dropping down. So instead of looking at the number of addresses, this is simply looking at the overall ratio of available Bitcoin. So you can see right now, wallets that hold 10 to 10K make up almost exactly two thirds of the overall supply of Bitcoin. Very interesting. Okay, can you tell me a little bit more about this? I'm just trying to wrap my head around how we might be able to interpret this into a trading thesis. And I'm, I'm having trouble just kind of formulating a precise question, but maybe that's enough. Any thoughts on my rambling here? Yeah, I, I mean, generally when larger players are accumulating, it's a sign of confidence for the network. Uh, the people who know the most about Bitcoin are the ones who hold the most and the people who have you know, been through the trenches the most. So if you're seeing a lot of key stakeholders accumulating more and more, it's generally a, a sign that markets are, are going to move in a positive direction. Sometimes they'll be taking profit though on a big rise like they did from October through now really, but uh, part of it now is, you know, we have the ETFs over the past four weeks that have, I guess, cannibalized to a certain extent the amount of wallets out there for both small and larger wallets. But 
I still think there's credence in looking at the percentage of supply held, not just for Bitcoin, but any asset you want to look at. Look at how the you know millionaires or even the hundred thousandaires are doing uh, in terms of their confidence in that asset, and you'll get a glimpse of what is likely to be the next trend for the uh, price. This has been great. Is there anything else that you wanted to mention that's kind of burning that uh, you wanted us to include here in this edit? No, I, I know we plan on doing some more videos, Trav. So I, I can leave the rest of the metrics for another day. And what we'll do is, you know, share our Discord link. And for anyone who wants to learn more, you know, just jump onto that Discord server and we'd be happy to talk to you. We've got a great staff uh, that talk about the metrics and, and geek out on this stuff just like myself. And uh, we, we try to make sure that anyone who is interested in this kind of data can get ramped up to speed and they're not getting lost. Perfect. And I can 100% attest to that. I've had uh, a whole bunch of questions here as I've been learning about the uh, the platform. And there's always been somebody there eager to uh, respond and with enthusiasm and incredible expertise. My mind's been blown every single time here. So, Brian, I really appreciate you spending the time with us today. I look forward to being able to join you again and diving into the rest of the tools that you have uh, available to all of us. And uh, yeah, no, just uh, I appreciate all the work that you do in this space. Love it, Trav. Can't wait. Thanks as always.